Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, for the keynote talk today, it's uh, my utmost pleasure to introduce a stalwart of the industry. Uh, Gadi Singer has been around for uh, several decades, pushing the leading edge of computing as technology went from one phase to another. He has made numerous contributions to Intel's computer architecture, hardware, software, and recently on the AI technologies. He is currently um, vice president at Intel Labs, where he leads cognitive computing research and development of a third wave of AI capabilities. Welcome, Gadi. Thank you, and I'm uh, very glad to be here. Um, my uh, profession <clears throat> for the last several decades has been computer architectures and how to drive energy efficiency while driving up compute. Uh, and my passion has been cognitive uh, computing for a while. And I'm uh, glad to be here and, and be able to really uh, look at those both aspects in this uh, workshop. And <clears throat> I'll talk today. Let me make sure that uh, um, this is presented in full screen. And let me know if you can see it in full screen. Can you see it? Yes, we can, Gaudi. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, um, before talking about uh, AI, I want to talk about the obvious uh, uh, example that we have for intelligence, uh, humans, and point to the fact that after growing uh, with our ancestors for um, billions of years, uh, the brain size uh, reached its full capacity, full size, um, about 200, 250,000 years ago. So modern humans have a brain size which is about the same as the first Homo sapiens. Uh, actually, in an interesting twist, in the last 10,000 years it has shrunk a little bit, but overall it has stayed the same for the last 200,000 years. And we know how much have we learned as, as a species, how many new capabilities and tasks and information we have acquired, and still the brain has about the same size and the same, about the same power consumption. And the question is, can we take the AI on a similar trajectory of after significant growth, we can take it to a sustainable, efficient form while still continuously driving intelligence higher and higher. And this is what cognitive AI is about. So this is a view on the uh, future of machine learning and uh, we'll talk about the fact that in addition to all the excellent innovation and improvements and evolution that is happening, there's a next wave, there's a new categorically different wave of AI that is emerging. And that new wave will, uh, will give the machine higher cognition, better understanding of the world, and overall higher intelligence. And this will be achieved by neurosymbolic systems, so by combining the strength of neural networks and the capabilities that symbolic systems provide. And it will be based on deep knowledge, which I will define and explain. The value to people and businesses will be redefined and amplified. Systems that will be able to be more adaptable, more robust, um, be able to understand, uh, they will definitely have much higher value. And this new level of capabilities at the algorithmic level is going to drive a new class of architectures. Architectures that integrate neural network, structured knowledge, symbolic uh, reasoning, and broad information extraction. We'll talk about what is world knowledge and why it is important that AI will have access to it. And this is inherently human-centric because we're talking about cognition and understanding, we talk about intelligible symbols. So this is a anthropocentric cognitive AI systems that are about to arrive. And the last decade was, was the deep learning decade. There's, there's no doubt about it. I would guess 
that most, if not all, the presentations today in the workshop are going to be on uh, neural networks and the variants. I might be wrong, but this is in many of, of the conferences and workshops, this tend to be a pretty significant part. And the reason is because there has been such tremendous um, revolution and then evolution in AI uh, by the introduction of new algorithms that translated to new frameworks that were implemented on new hardware. And all the measures that were put in in the early 2010s, like you know, ImageNet is obviously no longer relevant because it was completely solved, but um, all the language tasks, vision tasks, um, some autonomous tasks, all of those have seen tremendous progress over the last decade, driven primarily by deep learning. So that has been um, a significant, um, huge uh, jump, and it is not close to you know, saturating. There are so many implementations, so many applications of deep learning that are only now starting to get into, into uh, multiple companies, you know, going from the research world to the hyperscales scalers and now to many, many other companies. So this is huge. However, there are some fundamental challenges to deep learning as a technology. And now is the time to understand them and find a different way so that we can go beyond those um, barriers. And I'll point out four of those challenges. The first one is scale. And this was uh, mentioned you know, both by uh, Kushal and uh, Jichang. And um, this is uh, the growth. So I'm looking at the growth between you know, 2018 and 2021. Um, it is clear that we cannot continue with this trend. And I'll come back to this uh, in a couple of, in a few slides to this particular graph. There are also challenges today to robustness and trustworthiness. Even the best systems are performing at 97, 98 uh, percent, uh, which is good for, for maybe, you know, some tasks that uh, query answer, sometimes ads and so on. But um, no, you don't want your vehicle to be correct in 99 percent of its decision. Um, but there also there's, uh, there are all kinds of artifacts that are based on the IID, on the basic assumption of um, statistical correlation that um, creates limitations. It creates limitations when you're transferring to new, uh, new domain, when you're at the edge, uh, at the seven sigma, eight sigma of your own domain. So robustness and trustworthiness uh, definitely is, is a major issue. Human machine interaction is a major task. There are initial efforts for explainable AI, but the basic mechanism of deep learning is not as friendly for um, interpretability and explainability as uh, we would need, not only as we would like, but as we would need in order to be able to integrate it uh, in, in uh, all types of industry and usages. And finally, just the basic machine cognition. The ability of machines to understand what it does, for language models to understand, actually understand uh, language. Those are significant challenges. And uh, there is an understanding that there's a new wave of AI that is emerging. And uh, <clears throat> even though I might be bringing a compelling case, I'm sure you're not going to trust only me. Uh, but look at some of the other um, major voices. Uh, so uh, Yoshio Bengio in uh, his uh, exceptional keynote in Europe's 2019, he talked about system one versus system two cognition. And this is based on the model that was developed by Daniel Kahneman, uh, which is, a, uh, is not from the AI space. Uh, he is an economist and psychologist, uh, and a, a Nobel Prize winner. And he talks about having two systems for humans. System one, which is intuitive, fast and conscious, habitual. And this is, you can think about it, I don't know if you remember the times when you used to drive to work, but uh, it, back then, you knew the route very well. You could, during the drive, you could be on uh, 
uh, speakerphone and having a, a conference call or talking to somebody. And you, you know, your habitual could handle uh, navigating the world. That's a system one. And Joshua Bender is saying this is current deep learning, which I agree. And then it talks about system two. And system two is when you have a more logical, sequential, conscious process, process that requires reasoning, that requires planning. Um, and the example here is you're driving an environment that you're not familiar with, there's some uh, road work ahead, there's some other challenges, and you really need to concentrate on the road because you need to, to um, get new information, understand it, operate on it, do things that might be new in this situation. This is system two, and Joshua Bender is describing it as the future DL. I would say it's a future AI, and there are probably other ways of doing it, which I'll present, uh, of achieving the system two capabilities. And from a different direction, we've got DARPA, and DARPA around 2018, early 2019, um, went out with this uh, uh, initiative and, and uh, documentation work around the third world wave of AI, saying that there was the first wave, which was more handcrafted, this was, those were all the expert systems, and then there's the second wave, and the second wave is what we're <clears throat> experiencing now. It's statistical, it's machine learning, and, um, and this is very strong on perception and uh, feature learning and things that were not there in the first wave, but DARPA says, there is a third wave of AI that is coming. And that third wave, third wave is more cognitive, more adaptive, more contextual. So in addition to the perception and uh, learning that we get from deep learning, we have a much better way to abstract, to reason, to contextualize the world. And you have other example, Francois Cholet talking about the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns also talks about a new phase a categorically new phase that is starting. So this is about this new phase. And I would offer a view of cognitive AI. So let's for a minute <clears throat> imagine AI system that has fundamentally um, different and better capabilities than just statistical correlation. It can understand language with its meaning, not only predicting the next word or the next uh, phrase statistically. It is inherently multi-sourced and multimodal. Multi-sourced meaning that if you have different sources, even within the same modality, it can source them out, but it is inherently multimodal, as human intelligence is. It integrates common sense knowledge. Uh, this was called by some the, the black matter, uh, because it's not usually articulated in, in the uh, documentation, but it is a must for intelligence. So it integrates common sense knowledge and it's able to reason on that knowledge. It adapts to new circumstances and tasks, not only to new data, but to new circumstances and new tasks, new capabilities. So it's inherently able to grow its capabilities not only its ability to perform well in current capabilities. It can explain itself, and it can explain itself in a way that's uh, understandable by human. And it's generative by nature. So uh, even today, AI is both discriminative and generative, but this is generative uh, by nature. And it can explain new outcome even when it's generative and something in a new space. And it is more robust and more customizable. Because as we'll talk about how do you achieve all this, it uses symbolic entities, it uses concepts in order to understand the world. And the same way we do, it can use those concepts, those abstractions, in order to um, understand and learn new situations and customize to new environments. So um, I know it, some of it might sound a bit fantastical, but those are doable. And those competencies of human-centric cognitive AI can be achieved using knowledge that is structured, explicit, and 
intelligible. And the basic uh, uh, aspect of that um, in, in reaching this conclusion is to see the difference between cognition and recognition. So recognition, which is what neural networks do exceptionally well, works on shallow data. Uh, if you look at visual data that comes from a, a uh, camera, then you have pixels, but they have location in their array. And then each of the pixels have some information about um, maybe colors and, and uh, brightness and so on. It's very shallow. And then you use all the deep compute in order to extract the feature to understand the relationship between them uh, and so on. And, and all the recognition space is, um, is highly differentiable, which is something your know, networks do extremely well. Cognition, high cognition reasoning is different. In many cases, the input that you get from the world is very minimal, and you use a vast network of knowledge, of memory, of understanding, in order to interpret and act on this very scarce knowledge. And reasoning is based on that. So since I'm using the term deep knowledge, um, I would like to kind of define it and, and talk about knowledge constructs that allow an AI to continuously acquire new information. This whole method of training, then use, is not applicable in the real world in many usages. You need to be able to continuously acquire new information. You need to be able to use deep knowledge to organize a view of the world. So the internal knowledge is a model, a set, a representation of the world outside that the AI can operate on. It allows to comprehend meaning, and it allows the ability to reason on it. And maybe just to uh, uh, give a, an example at a very high level, uh, if you look at a, uh, uh, in the healthcare space, identifying bacterial infection. So uh, if you look at today's system, uh, today's systems have the ability to do image, medical image recognition very well, and in many cases, if you train it on uh, on um, uh, any type of on CT scans, on X-rays, whatever, you are able to um, to find all kinds of patterns. But in the future, you're looking at overall integrative system that does continuous learning, that can because of its multimodality and its uh, multi-sourcing, it is able to observe to take in all forms of data. Uh, including what the patient and the doctor said during each of the visits, the latest research, and can do a continuous process of observation, interaction, and diagnosis. And in order to do that, we're saying that the basis is the knowledge. So what would be the structure? What would this deep knowledge have in order to enable all, all those capabilities? And I offer this uh, model with kind of six uh, meta dimensions or, or six views of knowledge. The bottom three are knowledge about the world, and we'll talk a little bit about each of them. So uh, descriptive or declarative knowledge. This is static knowledge. Models of the world. Those are the dynamic models. What is the world dynamics? How are things? Uh, moving on time and uh, causal uh, systems are a key part of this uh, dynamic view of the world. And stories and scripts, we'll talk about those. And then there are two meta knowledge aspects context and source attribution is one, and the other one is values and priorities. And the last one, which connects all of them together, is concept. Our basic building block of mental uh, processes of thinking are concepts. And so uh, does the deep knowledge of future AI systems. So let's start with the first one, which is the descriptive knowledge. This is more of a, a static view, static in the sense that it describes a cup. It could change over time, but it describes something uh, like uh, what objects are there. What are the descriptions of those objects? 
how are objects tied together in ontologies? What is the hierarchical layering of classes or concepts? So all the taxonomies, uh, when we understand something about a new object, we learn a lot about uh, it being part of larger classes and we immediately know a lot of things. So if I tell you that there's a new uh, birds, bird identifier in the tropics uh, called Kukura, you already have so much information about animals, about birds, about the tropics, uh, to start with understanding this new object that you're just learning about. And it is allowing to acquire new knowledge into the structure. So it's not a fixed structure, but it is able to acquire facts, entities, relations, classes. And the difference between this and traditional knowledge-based systems, because knowledge-based systems that had similar concepts has existed since uh, for the 60s, um, is that we need to be able to acquire and integrate new knowledge by using deep learning and machine learning. And an example is if we have an, a, a concept of bacteria, we have a concept of bacterial infection of the lungs, then think about all the uh, information and all the knowledge regarding bacteria. So that's the static view, the descriptive knowledge. Then you have models of the world dynamics. This is how things in the world, how those objects interact, how they influence each other, how they operate over time. And um, this could be either a formal system like logic, um, uh, algebra, physics, um, as a set of equations, set of rules, or it could be more empirical. And it's, it could be in the physical world, or it could be uh, psychological or sociological. We have models, dynamic models, that we expect uh, in all those spaces. When you look, we, we uh, talked uh, the other day about um, interpreting an image in one of the benchmarks, and you see a confrontation between two people, and the question is, what does uh, one think based on his posture? And we have a model of fight or fl uh, uh, flight. It's a psychological model that we apply to interpret it. So this is a know-how in all aspects. And of course, one of the key aspects is uh, causal models. And uh, Judea Pearl is probably now happy to see that everybody uh, you know, understands why um, almost, you know, as, as he said in the, from the very beginning, and there's uh, increasing focus on that uh, with the DL space as well. But all those uh, dynamic models are the second kind of dimension. And the third one is stories and scripts. Stories are, uh, and scripts are complex and may include multiple events. So whether it's the, um, you know, the creation of religion and you have stories that everybody understands within Intel, uh, ev everybody that's more than a couple of years at Intel knows the story about uh, Gordon Moore and Andy Grove going into a room and then completely changing the business uh, from memories to processes. And this is part of the DNA because of the company because it says you can rethink who you are at any stage, even if it's major, if the environment has changed and success is elsewhere. So stories create a very deep foundation to learn from. And it's crucial information that helps develop understanding, uh, analogy, generalization. And um, uh, there's, a, a, the, uh, there's a problem called the grounding problem saying, how does AI know out of the many options what to do uh, in some situations? And scripts in many cases are the answer to that. When we do something, when we wake up and you know, uh, dress, brush our teeth and so on, we don't have to think about all the potential options. We have scripts to operate. Going into a um, physician office have its scripts. So stories and scripts are key, and they can, they can represent values and experience and inform people's beliefs and actions. So this is the third more complex structure of the, um, the description of the world. And then we talked about two meta-knowledge. The first one is context and source attribution. And the, the meta knowledge, such as context and source attribution, sits on top of all the other dimensions I just described. So you could have a source 
um, a, or in a uh, context to any piece of, of descriptive or, or uh, dynamic information or a story. And it provides a context. The context could be uh, persistent or global, which is long lasting, or could be transient. Uh, global could be if um, to answer the question whether um, when you come to a red light, you can turn to the right. It depends on geography. Uh, in some geographies, like in California and in many other countries, if you stopped at the red light, you can turn after you've, of course, observed traffic and so on. In some other countries, it will get you into deep trouble. So, so the answer to this question is, of course, context dependent, but the, everything is context either globally or locally within the paragraph, within the sentence. So context is key for understanding, but also data provenance. Deep learning usually just take in, ingest lots of information, put it in the blender, and then it builds its structure. But for us, we associate information with its source. We understand where it comes from. We apply some, some uh, value to where it comes from. We want to track it in many cases. So if you read the medical advice in the uh, New England uh, Journal of Medicine, or you read it in some, um, some magazine uh, of the wreck, you might treat it different because of the sourcing. And uh, you also understand bias. If you listen to news on Newsmax or Fox News in the US, or you listen to CNN, you know what to interpret the news through a lens of the uh, understanding the source. So context and source attribution is, is key to knowledge. And the other meta uh, knowledge aspect is values and priorities. And this includes aspects such as goodness, meaning how good or bad something is, how important or less important, how much of a threat does it propose, how well does it uh, uh, fit with my ethics system uh, versus not. And this is, this is very important because uh, when you get a lot of information, you want to make decisions. Decisions weigh between options based on some underlying value. So, um, when you look at, at, um, at uh, aspects like in health, you have things that are inherent, like maybe inherently a patient's life is more important than discomfort, but maybe not always. But there are some things uh, that, are, that are more relevant to the person. So it could be that, for example, financial impact of healthcare decisions are different when you talk about some billionaire versus when you talk about somebody Who's not? So values and priorities are a key overlay for intelligent understanding of the world and decision making. And finally, concepts. And concepts are the way all of this comes together. A concept reference or a concept is kind of the container, or maybe you can look at it as the set of pointers of everything related to a particular concept. So the concept of bacteria have elements from everything we talked about, which together create the meaning of what bacteria is. So it's disambiguated, it's unified, it's cross-modal, it's cross-dimensional, it's everything that we know consistently um, about the world that relates to bacteria is connected through its reference. And of course, there's a network of those um, concepts that creates kind of uh, a type of ontology. And just to you know, finish this thinking about defining what I see at least as understanding, and there's a blog that I wrote with this title, Understanding Often by Deep Knowledge. A knowledge-centric perspective of understanding says that, that understanding has three key elements. The ability to create a worldview through a rich knowledge representation. So you need to have, the machine needs to have a view of the world embedded as a worldview inside the machine. The second thing is the ability to acquire and interpret new information to enhance this worldview. So it's not only important to have a worldview, it's important to continuously interact with the world to compare, to correct things, to add things. And the third element, 
of understanding is the ability to effectively reason, decide, and explain over this knowledge and new information. So if you can represent the world, if you can continuously take in new information to enhance this representation, and if you can reason and explain over that, you have the full uh, task of understanding. So let's talk about efficiency and effectiveness. So far, we talked about effectiveness, but we want to be more intelligent. So do we need to be more expensive? Um, can we increase the capabilities and improve the results significantly, but by minimizing power and system cost, not by increasing it? So can we drive effectiveness and efficiency at the same time? And we've seen variants of this chart uh, of the growth of uh, language models as measured by the uh, number of uh, the complexity, uh, number of parameters, this is not sustainable. And you can argue whether it's three years, five years, but if you look at it by the end of the decade, especially if you take into account that this is all language and future um, models are going to be at least bimodal, but probably multimodal in terms of adding images as a learning vehicle, so images and text, um, this method, this approach is not sustainable. And I know that there are a lot of methods on how to improve it in terms, and some of them talking today, uh, compression and pruning and quantization and uh, distillation and, you know, the way to partition it through parallelism and, uh, and federation and so on. But fundamentally, this trend is not sustainable. And there's a great article by MIT and IBM uh, that are analyzing, you know, when is it going to reach computational limits if it continues this way, which it's not. And to understand how we can change this trajectory, we need to understand that the models today um, are, are uh, not what it was intended in the beginning. And we do that by asking the question, where does information reside? So rather than asking questions about processing, what algorithms do we do? Let's ask the question, where does information reside? And neural networks were not designed originally for memorizing facts. This is a fact. They, they were designed to create um, functions, to discover functions and patterns in differentiable space. And they're also extremely efficient in, uh, in the uh, syntactic and semantic space uh, to be able to identify statistical information about, about language. And, you know, language is not such a big deal. There are 170,000 words approximately in modern English. So if what you want is you, you want to understand grammar and something about those words, uh, you can do that very effectively with a large uh, deep learning model. But what it turns out is that language models are moonlighting as knowledge models. This is an interesting distinction that uh, Dr. Eugene Choi made in terms of language model is designed for language. Knowledge model is defined as something to contain knowledge. And uh, we assume that it's the same and we expect the GPT-3 and then by GPT-4, GPT-5 to be a knowledge model. But if you think about the type of information that you have, you know, what is the airport code of all the uh, key airports and definition of uh, all things and who are all the presidents in each year and who are the names of the kids of the president and all those are not uh, the original intent or the strength of neural networks. So the, the premise that I'm offering is that we should rather than just brute force growing neural network to try and get the whole world knowledge, we should refactor neural networks. And therefore, we can increase the scope of the AI while reducing the energy and the cost. And refactor, what I mean is, let the neural network do what it does so well. Deal with differentiable uh, functions. Uh, deal with statistics. And uh, give it the ability to extract or retrieve information when needed. But for the vast amount of information that is needed, keep that information outside of the neural network. So have the information stored in accessible knowledge repositories outside of the parametric memory itself. And this is not something that's unique. 
if you think about uh, systems, there is a tension between expediency or speed and capacity, scale. Usually, to get the utmost speed and expediency, you are at the top rank or a top tier of a hierarchy where the capacity might not be very large, such as in a computer system where for the highest uh, expediency you use the registers within the CPU or the cache system. And then as you go down the, uh, the hierarchy, the tiers, you have a lower speed, lower, um, you know, there's longer time to access, but there's much higher capacity. And this breakout of a very large scale uh, system into tiers is done everywhere in nature. Let's take a completely different system. You know, how do we use energy in our bodies? So the ultimate source of energy is outside in the world. It's unlimited external source of energy. And then within our body, we have all this standby energy that sits in, in fatty tissues, in the liver, in muscle cells. And then we have the operational energy that circulates in the bloodstream as glucose. And then there's the final gear kind of going into ATP and ATP in the cell breaking and becoming ADP. So you have this tier system or gear system that allows you to cover multiple orders of magnitude of expediency versus scale. And we should not think that AI and dealing with knowledge and information is any different. There is no one rung to rule them all. The idea that we can have a system like the mega GPT-7 that will have all the knowledge of the world and will be highly expedient and you know it will have this, this highest expediency and full scale is just not feasible when you have the a, a scale of knowledge that goes to the zeta, uh, zeta scale. Uh, there is a, a trade-off to be made and the way to solve it like in like nature solves it, like computers solve it, is by creating various rungs. There is no one rung to rule them all. And let's look at the example of knowledge and simplify it to three levels, even though, of course, it could be, um, it, could, it doesn't have to be three, but three is kind of the minimum to create a range of multiples orders of magnitude. And let's look at it uh, on human. So let's say that there's a, a doctor and, um, and she's asked, um, can I give, uh, give this patient this uh, fever medication together with this anti-inflammatory medication? And the doctor answer immediately, yes. Why? Because she has seen this question, she has heard this question uh, thousands of times, she doesn't have to think about it. It's a system one, if you go back to Yoshio Benjo's definition, uh, it's a system one habitual answer. And this is the most expedient one. Let's say she's asked, can I give uh, the patient this drug together with this drug that, uh, that um, is used usually for other cases? And the doctor says, um, let me think about it. Yeah, I know I use both those drugs. I understand their interaction mechanism and you can use them. She applied system two. She had to think about what those drugs are, how they operate on the body, where does the body uh, dispense them and, and break them and so on. She did some reasoning, she gave an answer. That's a system two type of an answer. And then thirdly, uh, there's a new drug that came just was approved just last week. And uh, the doctor says, wait a minute, I need to go to the library or I need to, to go online and I need to use external information. So it's not just what's in my brain as habitual or something that requires reasoning. I need to get to the outside of my, my skull in order to get the information. And I would say that within uh, AI systems of the future, you will find the same three levels. You will have the most expedient system one type of information within the neural network, within the parametric memory. You will have a couple of orders magnitude more information in a deep knowledge base that is well structured in an adjacent space that's still part of the AI, like a system two for humans. And you will have continuous ability due, through inference to look at information in large information repositories, kind of the world knowledge. And I call this kind of blueprint 3LK, so 3LK or 3LK, because it's a, it represents a tiered system 
for using information. And we can look at it as uh, breaking it to day system to three classes. First class is AI systems with fully encapsulated information. And most of the systems today are such. You know, all the systems that are end to end deep learning are, are class one because all the information is encapsulated. You've trained it, it knows what it was trained to do. The second class is AI systems with semi structure adjacent information. That's a bit long, but what it says is that you can reach the outside world, uh, like a Wikipedia or like all the information during training and during inference in order to retrieve it. And therefore, you don't have to have all the information within your network. You can retrieve the required information from the outside world when needed. And a great example for that is, is uh, you, know, you can take it in RAG, uh, the Retrieval Augmented uh, Generation. It's an excellent paper that uh, was um, published by the Facebook AI Research and NYU. And um, it solves NFP tasks by really creating this uh, retrieval mechanism over a dense vector index. So it indexes all of Wikipedia. And then uh, when you have a, a query that, that deals with uh, some point in the embedded space, it looks for the most similar power graphs uh, like that in there. And Hugging Face, uh, actually I saw that there's a presentation um, uh, presented something very interesting about how this approach gives you much better uh, provenance because you know where you brought the information for the results as well as interpretability. So this is a way for the neural network to access the full uh, information of the world of the Wikipedia in this case. And then class three is where you have a deep knowledge base, where you have a, uh, a structured information with objects, uh, which concepts that are connected, an example to that could be uh, Wikidata. And uh, you need to be able to extract information into this, but uh, you also um, you also use the neural network in order to do a lot of the analysis and bring information. Uh, a good example uh, to this, of course, are uh, Google working on its huge knowledge graph, everything happening on Wikidata. And there's also a, a system that I really like. It's called the Neural Symbolic Question Answer by Answering by uh, IBM Research, which uses a AMR, an uh, uh, abstract meaning representation, in order to take an input, structure it in a more canonical form, and then operate on it. And it has this uh, access to deep knowledge. Now, the system of the future will integrate all those three types. So this is the blueprint that I'm offering you as the AI system of the future. And it includes all three classes. It includes the neural network for the expedient aspects. It includes a deep knowledge base for structured information that between those two, they have all those six dimensions that I've described. But it also have the ability to continuously during training as well as inference, be able to access reliably all the digital source of the world. And if you think about scales, the scale of the neural network is about giga scale. And the scale of the deep knowledge base is about tera scale, could be high tera. And the scale of the outside information is zeta. I mean, it's zeta or maybe higher. It's all the world knowledge that is relevant across imagery and, you know, um, text and other sources of information. And this is just um, one of the uh, examples of the power of retrieval. So this is from uh, a paper called Generalization Through Memorization, Nearest Neighbor Language Models, and it was published by um, Stanford University and Facebook. And, uh, and uh, this, if, if I look at it, they used one model, and they um, had three methods. They took this model and they trained it on 100 million um, bits of information. Um, and and uh, uh, if you look at the uh, y-axis here, uh, perplexity is, a graph, is, of course, an axis where lower is better in terms of uh, the uh, quality of the predictability of the next item. 
So what you can see is that when they have this weekly 100 million, which is the top red line, of course, it has um, fixed um, perplexity, regardless of the knowledge access, because it has no knowledge access, and its quality is not that great. The blue line is the same um, model, but being trained on 3 billion. So its data set is 3 billion. And you can see that the blue line is much better, much lower perplexity than the red line. Meaning when you train a model on more information, it does better. No, no, of course. The yellow line is the interesting one. And they used a, um, a KNN uh, language model. So a retrieval language model with a K uh, nearest neighbor uh, approach. You're looking at a uh, whole data set and then based on matching of their signature or their embedded vector, you're pulling in their nearest neighbor. And what you see here, that when you expose it to larger and larger models, uh, larger and larger data sources, which is the x-axis, the results get better. And with the same small model, it gets better and better and better, and it surpasses a much more better trained model in terms of the, the amount of information. So a model with limited training, but with the ability to retrieve information, can beat in terms of both the scope and power model with extensive training. And this has been proven multiple times. There are some benchmarks like Efficient QA is a competition that Google has in the last couple of NeurIPS. And uh, only retrieval-based solutions are on the top spots of the leaderboard. They have four categories across all those categories. So retrieval of information works, and we need to rethink about what sits in the neural network, what sits in the adjacent structure, intelligible knowledge uh, source, and what sits outside and how to access it. So I believe that a new set of cognitive AI competencies will emerge. We'll talk about the time frame, and it will unlock uh, and the capabilities and systems that are more explainable and be able to do many more things compared to today. And I'm not talking necessarily AGI, but it's much closer in that journey than systems that we have to be categorically different. And this next level of machine intelligence will require reasoning over deep knowledge structures, knowledge structures that include facts, and uh, declarative knowledge like know, uh, that causal knowledge like know why, uh, contextual knowledge like know when, relational knowledge like know with, and all the other types of knowledge that I've mentioned. And the use of this three-level knowledge hierarchy, the 3 k hierarchy, can address those, this fundamental tension. It allows system to be able to do much more, but because it partitions, it keeps the most expensive uh, structures of neural network limited. In the examples that that uh, I showed you before, the network that they used was did not new, uh, need you know tremendous you know uh, compute infrastructure, dedicated accelerators and so on, and was able to do a lot by combining the neural network uh, abilities with all the knowledge that it retrieved. So this three level, the three K hierarchy can help us increase the capabilities materially while decreasing power and computing cost. So let's imagine those capabilities. Let's imagine a cognitive AI system that goes well beyond statistical correlation to understand language, to inherently deal with multimodality and multi-source, to be able to integrate common sense through its knowledge structure and reasoning on top of it, that is able to adapt to new circumstances at task. If you think about it, if there's one of 50,000 companies that does not have the resources of Google or Facebook or Baidu, and they can bring in their information and their tasks through a knowledge structure, not through training a, a model for tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars with an expensive data science team, but through the ability to bring new information that is accessible to an existing neural network and through that adopt to new circumstances. 
it can explain itself because it uses intelligible node, uh, knowledge structures and it extracts information from known sources. And it is more robust and customizable because it uses a concept of bacteria, a concept of a traffic sign, not just superficial indication of it. And in terms of a timeline, I believe that today we are about where deep learning was in uh, about this time a decade ago. So you know, just uh, before or you know, around AlexNet. And uh, this is still nascent. But if you follow a same trajectory, we can expect that cognitive AI will be in commercial play uh, in, by 2025. <clears throat> and once uh, able to deal with uh, other aspects, if you can do multimodal tasks, you can also do unimodal tasks much better. So by 2030, I expect it to be prevalent and central. So what is our role? as AI technologies to develop those algorithms, those systems, to elevate AI to categorically higher cognition, while at the same time focusing on system efficiency by doing what has to be done with high energy and what does not have to be done with the same expediency in a tiered system. And for everyone, it's just to imagine what you will be able to do when you have cognitive AI in a few years. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Gary. That was a fascinating talk and uh, a view to, of what's to come in the future. If there are any questions, uh, please uh, raise your hand. Use the raise the hand button in Teams, and uh, I'll point you to um, unmute yourself. And uh, right. while we're collecting questions, um, Gary, when you were talking about the knowledge, uh, the deep knowledge approach, I was kind of reminded of web search in which you have a a front end of a knowledge, um, a front end of a transformer like neural network, which is interpreting queries and then piping it down to uh, a back end where they have an index of a bigger knowledge graph. Do you see a similar a similarity there? Yes, this is definitely one way of doing this. Um, you have a broader knowledge graph, which is uh, which can scale much higher because you, you are not impact the uh, the way in which the growth of the graph impacts you is just by a, a minor log increase because you can increase the knowledge graph by much with increasing the index by little. So you're not that impacted by the, the uh, amount, the volume, the scale, and you still use the, the neural network uh, at the top level to, to drive the process. So yes, uh, this is a very good example of how this could be at a larger scale, but um, I want to emphasize the need to be able to access external world knowledge as well, in order to avoid trying to put everything within the knowledge graph. Any other questions for Gadi? Gadi, this is Kushal. If I may, can I go? For sure. A question for them? OK, so, uh, so you, uh, in the next gen cognitive AI, Gadi, you talked about this. There's an element of subjective decision making, right? Which you alluded towards uh, in the earlier part of your talk. So um, my question is from a system builders perspective, like myself, right? Who are dealing with software and hardware innovations. What do you see our focus should be and how to enable this subjective decision making, right? I'm, I'm, I, I don't want to go into the ethical and all those parts because you yeah. know this is not my area of expertise, but as system builders, what do you think we should focus on? Is it more about knowledge systems or is it more about compute capability? Where should we as a community focus? Yeah, thank you for, for the question. So um, the two things I would I would recommend to guide you is make uh, the value system transparent and controllable. Uh, every system that makes decisions is applying some value system. And value in this case doesn't have to be in the ethical um, sense only, but you know you have to value what different options give you and cost you. And, um, and the best thing that we can expect is to be able to expose the value system. So in the, in the description that I gave, if you can have the weights and the values in a way that's explicit, and you can have it exposed or transparent to the system designers. And maybe if it's, it can be exposed to the users of the system so that they know what type of trade-offs are being made. 
and you're able to, in some way, either control it completely or influence it so that you can, if you don't like it, you can change the values. Um, at least it means that the systems will reflect what the system designers or the system users want it to reflect. Now, you can't always make, um, uh, you know, make it do good because the system designers might have some other intentions and uh, I don't know how to solve that problem, but we can solve the problem of creating AI systems that will do, that will reflect the best of us, that will build into their value system, into their priority setting, things that are both transparent and are able to be controlled or influenced in a direct manner. So if you can, as a system designer, um, think about how you partition the information and the weights that are influencing decision making and how you can um, best expose uh, and, and make transparent the value system that it has. Thank you, Gary. Any other questions for Gary? I'll queue up one more, um, so, and it's kind of related to what you were talking about. Uh, what's your belief? Can higher concepts like ethics and responsibility be codified in mathematical terms that we can use to um, express the objective functions of these um, next generation neural networks? I know in the autonomous driving domain, uh, there is effort from the industry, including Mobileye, to, to codify these principles. What's your belief? I believe that it is possible, and I believe that by going towards the proposal that I'm making, which is uh, having uh, intelligible, explicit structures, including structures of values, it makes it easier than when you codify it into a, just a mathematical function. Because if a system elevates things to the conceptual level, which is something we haven't gone into, but it's implied by what I described, and you weigh the same people weigh the conceptual uh, implications of that using a value system that's explicit, uh, then you can uh, you can do you can do well. Meaning you can codify it in this. If you remember, one of the six dimensions was values and priorities, so you can codify it there. I I think Fanny had a question. If I'm can, Hi. Yes, I had a question. Um, so I the, the talk was great, and I, I agree with that there is a need of revolution for the current AI to get to this other level for us to answer more different questions um, than the regular, um, you know, DNN or deep learning is trying to answer right now. But I have a question regarding the current effort that many different companies from industry or academia are doing to answer the AI trend. So right now, AI is mainly deep learning and and DNNs, and that's scaling out, it's exponentially growing, and the, there is a need to answer this need by either improving hardware, improving the systems, improving the software, or doing a co-design between software and hardware. But with your proposal with cognitive AI, how do you see that? Is there a disconnection? Because it is going to keep going with this effort of doing this addressing this, ver this version of AI that we have, but cognitive AI, I think, will have a different signature so do you see it's a disconnection or is it still going to go through the same trend? So I see it as two, um, two directions that will feed on each other. Uh, all the work, and you, you did a very good job in articulating the various aspects of the work that are done to improve, improve deep learning solutions, need to continue. They have lots of value. And they have great value because deep learning, in its current form and how it evolved, has so much applicability that we need to continue to drive optimization of systems, hardware software code design. Uh, all those aspects are very valuable going forward. And also when you have neurosymbolic systems that are based on deep knowledge, which is what I'm advocating, you will have a neural network component that you would like to apply uh, all this technology to make it more efficient, to make it more capable. So all those, this direction is has to continue. But in parallel, as an emerging research then turn into commercial, we need to look at refactoring those systems, not to replace them, but to augment them, 
with a structure that will allow both scale as well as the uh, effectiveness of the tasks by being able to do much better cognitive tasks. So we need to do both. Thanks. All right, we are at the hour. Thank you again, Gary, for taking time and educating us about this, um, your vision of AI. My pleasure. Thank you.